Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Frederick Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra book. It is quite witty, I do say. I do say. We were in paragraph number three. Go ahead and listen to this as you are whittling, changing your tires, watering your garden, hanging out with your cats, whatever fun thing you're doing. All right, let's begin. When Zarathustra had said these words, he became silent, like one who has not yet said his last word. Long he weighed his staff in his hand doubtfully. At last he spoke thus, and the tone of his voice had changed. Now I go alone, my disciples, you two go now, alone. Thus I want it, verily I counsel you. Go away from me, and resist Zarathustra. And even better, be ashamed of him. Perhaps he deceived you. The man of knowledge must not only love his enemies, but he must also be able to hate his friends. <laughs> That's an interesting one. I've never heard that before. I've heard the crap of love your enemies. How am I love my enemies? That one I never understood. Defeat your enemies. <laughs> but to hate your friends? What do you think he means by that? One repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. And why do you not want to pluck at my wreath? Ooh. So, ah, if you always remain a student, it's kind of like an insult to the teacher, right? They didn't level you up enough. Now, the wreath that you wear of wisdom, that Greek and Roman styling, like to pick at it, like, yeah, I'm your student, I'm coming for you. You revere me, but what if your reverence tumbles one day? Beware lest a statue slay you. Beware lest a statue slay you. So the statues they do of art of great men. So their reputation precedes them. Emanates from them. Even after their death. Due to the fact that they have had something erected for them. And you can always compare yourself to that statue. So, if somebody's reputation that's attached to their symbolic statue is able to beat your present reputation, well, you didn't really succeed then, because someone is beating you from the grave. It's a very interesting way of looking at it, but in Islam, that type of iconography, that type of sculpturing isn't really wise. And we have a hadith about people who made statues and I believe in the time of Noah and then these people who didn't know the reputation of those just regular people started to worship them saw them as gods and interestingly in archaeology they call everything a god like oh the ancients thought this was a god so they made a little totem and you're like could have just been somebody bored creating something you're just making things up at this point so, we have our reasons on why we don't do that. But I do think this is witty to say, beware lest the statue slay you. And how weak are you if a statue, which cannot move and really harm you, is able to damage reputation and exceed you still? You say you believe in Zarathustra, but what matters, Zarathustra? You are my believers, but what matter all believers? You had not yet sought yourselves, and you found me. Thus do all believers, therefore all faith amount to so little. Now I bid you lose me, and find yourselves. <laughs> lose me, and find yourselves. And only when you have all denied me will I return to you. 
Ooh, that sounds a little Christian right there, though. Verily, my brothers, with different eyes shall I then seek my lost ones. With a different love shall I then love you. And once again, you shall become my friends and the children of a single hope. And then shall I be with you the third time, that I may celebrate the great noon with you. And that is the great noon, when man stands in the middle of his way between beast and overman, and celebrates his way to the evening as the highest hope, for it is the way to a new morning. Then will he who goes under bless himself for being one who goes over and beyond, and the sun of his knowledge will stand at high noon for him. The sun of his knowledge will stand at high noon for him. Ooh, that's so very symbolic. Have you noticed how much sun art there is? Like Louis the Fourteenth called himself the Sun King. The Aztecs with their sun iconography. Like there's so much around sun worship and sun this and sun that. That when you read a line like this, that the sun of your knowledge will stand at high noon for you. You're right over your head, shining down. This one is the hottest, too. I hate noon. The sun is just, if it's 90 degrees and the sun is on you, just bearing down on your head. I like before 9, it's the coolest. And then after 5, you know, 6, 7, it starts to get cooler. But that's interesting dead are all gods now we want the obermen to live and on that great noon let this be our last will thus spoke Zarathustra now that's a new line because Nietzsche is famous for his god is dead now we see he has another line dead are all gods wow so he didn't just single out the Christian God, but also all gods. The next section is titled, Thus Spoke Zarathustra Second Part. And only when you have all denied me will I return to you. Verily, my brothers, with different eyes shall I then seek my lost ones. With a different love shall I then love you. I don't know. I had a bunch of, uh... Okay, sorry. There was a bunch of footnotes. The child with the mare. Then Zarathustra returned again to the mountains and to the solitude of his cave and withdrew from men, waiting like a sower who has scattered his seed. But his soul grew full of impatience and desire for those whom he loved because he still had much love to give him for this what is hardest to close the open hand because one loves and to keep a sense of shame as a giver thus months and years passed for the solitary but his wisdom grew and caused him pain with its fullness. One morning, however, he woke, even before the dawn, reflecting long, lying on his bed, and at last spoke to his heart. So notice this. So he's gone to the mountains for solitude, and not only that, he's in a cave. And he's still growing impatient, And I think it's quite interesting how there seems to be this seed analogy. Because some would argue that like the acorn tree, you know, the oak tree, grows so slow that if you were just to stare at a little tree as it grows over the years, it would feel like it's never growing. 
but you have to kind of withdraw from the tree and then before you know it it's you know, 20 years gone by that tree is quite big you have to be patient but the more you stare at it the more you're gonna be urging it to grow faster so if you want to see the fruit of your labor in your orchard you have to be patient with each little tree till it grows up and gives you what you had hoped for so when he goes about dropping seeds of knowledge and waiting for it to bear fruit and he's getting impatient I, we can see the unique analogy there for us it says though years passed for the solitary that's quite a long time months and years but his wisdom grew and caused him pain with its fullness. So the bearing of knowledge upon one's soul. This is also very unique. Because some people can have so much knowledge and they, they're they so anxious to impart it onto others. And they, they want to wake people up. And some people don't want to be woken up. And they kind of just want to go with the flow. So that knowledge can burn a hole in your pocket as they say, and you feel its pressure, especially if you don't have as many people to talk to about your knowledge. The life of a very wise hermit can bear heavy on the soul. When you're surrounded by people who don't want to learn, and they want to put the head in the sand, and you have a sense of urgency and a sense of duty and honor to help reform the world, well, that's going to make you want to withdraw, right? This is interesting. So now Les spoke to his heart. Why was I so startled in my dream that I awoke? Did not a child step up to me carrying a mirror? O oh, Zarathustra, the child said to me, look at yourself in the mirror. But when I looked into the mirror, I cried out, and my heart was shaken, for it was not myself. I saw, but a devil's grimace and a scornful laughter. Verily, all too well do I understand the sign and admonition of the dream. My teaching is in danger. Weeds pose as wheat. My enemies have grown powerful and have distorted my teaching till those dearest to me must be ashamed of its gifts I gave them. I've lost my friends. The hour has come to seek my lost ones. So here, weeds pose as wheat. Can't make bread from an invasive plant, right? And when a plant has dried, sometimes identifying it can be difficult. His enemies have grown powerful, and with that power, they've helped to distort what it is he meant. Reminds me of how in Islam we are warned to not do bida, innovation, stick to the Quran and Sunnah, and that every newly invented manner matters. Or every newly invented matter is misguidance. So, you have to watch out. People can just riddle things in, twist it, distort. Before you know it, that distortion will you'll, you'll lose all the wisdom and the benefits of it because it wasn't accurate. So it's not going to carry the same baraka, the same blessings. Interesting. And that inferiority feeling, due to lack of accurate knowledge, can make one lose their self and their friends who are on the same path as them. So you can see some interesting coded language here. So when he says, I've come to seek my lost ones, reminds me of the Christian shepherding, right? You go find the lost sheep, get them back into the herd. So for this type of Christian language, you're seeing that come about here, where somebody who was told something that was inaccurate left the flock and now they have to be brought back in by the neck, the staff of the shepherd that helps him to walk so that they can be back on track. It's 
it's quite interesting, I must say. Very unique section. The whole mirror, and he's seeing a devil's grimace was quite strange. But I'm sure he'll explain more of that later, and we'll see what he meant. Let me know what you think, and if you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Archive. Hope to see you there.